this course. Um, so far, the themes that we've looked at may be very familiar to those of you who've worked with World Heritage before. We started looking at um, the values and the outstanding universal value and the attributes. And then yesterday looked very much at management issues. And uh, obviously that shares a lot of material that you, you would find in, in many World Heritage courses. Today, we are going to move on more specifically to looking at the development project and how you can identify impacts and then analyze them. So today, um, you'll find we move into more, uh, it's more unfamiliar perhaps, but it only works, what, the work we do today only works if we remember the foundations that we created in these first days. So everything hopefully today will become very clear that our discussion of impacts must always be connected to the discussion of the world heritage and our understanding of it. And that uh, the management that Eugene was talking about yesterday, if that works well, it can support impact assessment. And in fact, the process of impact assessment can sometimes uh, reinforce the management system as we realize what issues we're facing and we might want to make adjustments to the management system. So that's where we are today. I think um, as people arrive, we probably want to just move straight into Escanio's presentation. Fortunately, with the recording, those people who missed the beginning can review this, this section online later. So I think we probably uh, want to get to what is the heart of our um, discussion today with these presentations. So let me let me stop speaking. Yeah, I, I think we can start. Uh, I don't know if we, we want to use this time uh, to complete the exercise, but no, because yesterday we already go forward with the values and attributes. We, we will complete uh, later. And uh, okay, I will start sharing the screen. Okay, I hope you can see. Yeah, as Sarah said, today we will go deeply inside this uh, process. Uh, I want to underline this word because uh, if you remember yesterday at the very last part of the uh, discussion, we start uh, talking about the, the project and everybody of us has his own opinion about uh, uh the building uh, the development itself uh, and the um, all the issues related to it uh, i just want to underline that uh, in this kind of approach uh the evaluation should must be fit inside a very precise uh, um, process it's not a matter thinking about i like it or I don't like it, no? It's a, a matter of understanding uh, exactly uh, which could be the impacts related to specific attributes that uh, highlights the values and the outstanding universal values of the property. So uh, I just want to underline this concept uh, and this kind of approach that is very important because normally when we uh, deal with this kind of assessment, uh, uh, we are all professional, we, are, we have all our skills, our experiences, so we are all uh, um, uh, conditioned by uh, our uh, previous experience. So uh, this kind of approach is, a, you have to think, has a tool, a wall tool that allow you to and help you to, uh, to go inside the process and give uh, the exact uh, uh, answer to uh, if there is or not uh, there isn't uh, an impact on uh, outstanding universal values. So just uh, this recap to uh, to highlight this very important approach that you have to take in consideration during also the exercise. So um, I just want to start uh, uh, coming back to the my previous slides on values and attributes. I just add uh, another cloud, uh, the green cloud, that uh, I, uh, I call changes. So we talk about attributes and values uh, and uh, the uh, trying to explain uh, how they uh, can describe the significance 
and uh, in, uh, in general uh, description, the OUV of a property. We all, as we have learned yesterday from uh, uh, Eugene's presentation, this, uh, uh, this context, is, uh, this, uh, the property and the OUV that we identify for a special place in the world is always uh, uh, around the by changes, development, and uh, in general, as we have seen yesterday, there are so many components that uh, uh, lead and bring together uh, the complexity of, the, of a place. We talk about the environment, uh, the anthropic uh, uh, pressures, uh, and uh, all the components that made uh, the, this heritage a place. And uh, talking about a place, we have to consider it always uh, uh, all the components, mostly people interacting with this place. This is seems to be redundant in, <coughs> in this uh, speech, but uh, it's very important to consider during the assessment because once we highlight some attributes, uh, these attributes are always related to other components uh, around it. So people that are interacting with these attributes and so are uh, making uh, some values emerging uh, in respect of the uh, others' values. So this is very important uh, to take in consideration. Uh, I just used this picture from the nomination file for the um, Church of Nativity and Pilgrimage Pilgrim route. Uh, as you can see, this is the uh, buffer zone and uh, the, um, the location uh, of the two projects that uh, I, I hope I'm not, uh, I'm not made the mistake, but I just put these two uh, white dots. Um, the, the parking, the, 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 the center, and the, uh, the route, the, the tunnel. Um, as, you, as you can see, just, just looking at a very uh, fast uh, look to this picture, you can understand how the complexity of this place is. Uh, there is the church, there is a, a route, there are a lot of buildings where people live. So uh, just want to highlight that your approach must be always considering uh, at uh, 360 degree. So looking uh, outside your impact. And uh, once you have looked outside, you can look inside and uh, uh, fit to propose your assessment. Um, as I said before, we are dealing with the process. So at which stage we are? We are going, as Sarah said, to the uh, we're going with the identification of values and attribute, the characterization. So we are uh, able uh, at this stage to describe exactly which are the values, which are the attributes, what is the significance of this place. We really understand how it is so important, how it, ha it has outstanding universal values. We are at the stage of the impacts. Uh, two words, uh, on values, uh, two words, and this is very important, not towards general uh, impacts uh, around it, but towards the proposed project. So uh, once we have understand the place, we have to focus and try and try. We have we should have to understand really deeply in detail which is the process, uh, the project, uh, which are the components of the project, uh, how large, how wide is, uh, uh, if, if there are any consequence about uh, uh, some issues that we can highlight. Uh, summarizing the, the process that uh, we are following during these days, so all these uh, colors, color code scale, uh, we, 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 we talk at this stage uh, uh, until the point four, so the baseline assessment. We are dealing with the point five, six, and seven. So understanding the proposed action, as you remember, during the, uh, the first day, we described the, the two case studies. So the um, Villa Adriana and Goal, and one part of the uh, HIA was to really go deeply inside the project, understanding the drawing, uh, um, and all the related uh, components of the building. Um, once we have understand, uh, understood this uh, uh, development, we should go uh, to identifying and try to uh, highlight the potential impacts that could have. Um, the evaluation is a, a very <laughs> next step. And uh, I don't think that the, at this stage we just go 
during the exercise uh, in some kind of evaluation of these impacts uh, because the, the, the final goal for the course is to create a scoping report. So um, we will describe later how to deal with this, but uh, you have to keep in mind uh, all these three steps in sequence. Uh, which is the role, I just want to use uh, the, the slide that I use for documentation because I just added also in this case uh, another wheel. Uh, as we talk about uh, which is the role of documentation towards uh, attributes and values, uh, we should think also which is the role of documentation uh, in, the, uh, in the impact assessment process, which are the questions. So if we are asking which are the impacts, how do they affect how you V, how do we evaluate the severity of the impacts, how do we propose uh, mitigation, these all are questions that could be answered uh, in a very analytical way. And the, the, the way in which we give a suggestion, answer, in which we evaluate, we have to use uh, all the documentation and data analysis, as we have seen for the GIS uh, uh, tool, uh, to demonstrate and to give strength to our, uh, our ideas, our proposed. So it's uh, mainly, is the documentation process and data analysis that the main wheel that gives the strength to the assessment to go towards the, the, uh, the final goal uh, that is identifying the impacts on OUV. Um, impacts, so towards the development, highlighting the threats, but I just is the main goal uh, as we have described uh, till here, but uh, we can add another label that is uh, trying to find also the opportunities that this development uh, can create. This is the, the line at the bottom. You can, you can follow the line also in a horizontal way. So starting from the Halliday Artibus, we can find opportunities towards a sustainable development. So. Uh, all this uh, schema, all this diagram should be read in vertical columns, but also in horizontal. So impact and assessment should be read as a development assessment, threats assessment, and find the opportunities towards a final goal that is suggest a sustainable development to, to the heritage place. Um, the, in this case, uh, as for the have values and the attributes, uh, Talking about heat packs means talking about the component, uh, what is this heritage place? Um, we describe who, so the audience who is interacting uh, with the heritage place and how we will, we will follow uh, later in the morning, how to deal uh, with the mitigation and recommendation. Uh, now we are um, already, um, dealing with the, uh, the component what. So try to describe not only the significance of the place that we already done, but also the significance of these impacts towards this uh, thing, this what, what is the heritage. Um, I just put these two slides. As we can see, um, starting, and this is part of the, your previous exercise, the attribute mappings. Uh, the exercise is, is uh, the goal, the final goal of that, those as uh, the exercise for attribute mapping was to highlight the distribution of the components of the, um, of the property. In this case, just only uh, looking at this picture, we can see three main components uh, and uh, the church, the three convents and the gardens uh, in, the, in yellow. But uh, if we look uh, outside, we can see the entire city with new buildings, uh, with the old historic center and uh, clearly the route that goes uh, around it. So um, these are a first approach that can make it, us to uh, take uh, in consideration what, what, what we, we should have taken in consideration. And if we enlarge our view, our point of view, we also see has this uh, uh, context is inserted in a very, um, in a complex uh, 
old town uh, that we should consider. Uh, all the plans that, all the maps that are inside the uh, nomination file are very um, powerful in describing uh, this kind of relation. So uh, I want to highlight that uh, um, the first approach should be a spatial approach. Uh, understanding the setting inside which the heritage is uh, uh, inserted. Insert. Uh, and this is the first approach that can be, uh, and uh, can allow us uh, not to focus only on uh, very specific issues that maybe comes from our skills, from our experience. So always take uh, in consideration on your uh, desk, uh, a very general map and uh, always have a look to this uh, in order to consider uh, the wide, the, a wider approach to the, and the uh, ensemble of the, all the components. Um, we are going now deeply how we can manage this kind of uh, uh, process. We, uh, we describe as we can approach the, uh, how the, com the attributes and could the, uh, could, uh, could be described and uh, understanding what we are really assessing. In this case, uh, um, the exercise that we have done on attributes mapping, uh, trying, uh, as I, I said yesterday, uh, starting from the statement of outstanding universal value, we can extract uh, some uh, parts of it and try to uh, identify the attributes. In this case, for example, the first one was the site also included Latin, Greek and Orthodox, Franciscan and Armenian convents and churches, as well as bell towers, terrace gardens and the pilgrim route. This synthesis is very dense uh, as you can understand, because it is describing a very detailed, uh, uh, complex building with a lot of carpet that brings to different kind of values. For example, the religious uh, religious uh, categories, uh, but also architectural uh, uh, related architectural values uh, to the building itself. Uh, the the terrace gardens, uh, the approach towards uh, um, the daily life or the life uh, inside the components, uh, the pilgrimage route, so all the social um, things that happens around this building uh, because of the nativity, because of the uh, sacred uh, building. So um, all the sentences inside the statement uh, will bring us to uh, highlight and extract the uh, right attributes to assess. Uh, this is the values and attributes table that you should have done for uh, during the exercise. So starting from these, uh, in this case, we have the category, the value and the attributes. Uh, which are the, the, the questions that we have to, 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 to put uh, towards each of the attributes that we have done. For example, the assembly of religious buildings, uh, which are these buildings, uh, how these buildings uh, are impacted from uh, the view, uh, the views towards and for uh, and through the, the, the building, uh, or if something happened around uh, going to uh, or uh, or uh, 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 all the components that uh, made up this building uh, uh, inside uh, uh, to near the, uh, the development. So uh, each attribute should be evaluated with specific question. Uh, the, the guidance, uh, the previous guidance, uh, um, give us also some uh, uh, main, main uh, 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 I don't know how to say main uh, um, <clears throat> main approaches, main uh, main context to to, and the, the main one is to be specific. Uh, normally, uh, cumulative happenings and incremental changes may also more easily pass undetected. This is the main problem towards uh, the difference uh, between AIA approach, so the environment and the uh, heritage uh, approach. Uh, the new guidance is proposing an integrated approach, as Sarah has described uh, in the first days, very first days. Uh, but at this stage, if we have to fit to propose, if we have to describe in detail each kind of impacts that are that is uh, towards a specific attribute, uh, we can understand that a multidisciplinary approach is no longer enough. 
uh, we have seen in the case studies uh, uh, examples as we have um, we need we need to uh, to take uh, also other kind of consultants uh, very specialist engineer for portal uh, for port, uh, uh, for uh, water and port management, but every uh, heritage, each kind of uh, uh, heritage assessment has its own specialist needed to be uh, taken on board. Uh, so it's not enough uh, the legal experts, it's not enough institutional manager, manager uh, mainly in uh, in your in your uh, in this case study uh, you should also think which kind of uh, um, specialist and skills is needed before going to uh, to the assessment um, the key concept that we can uh, point out and describe uh, as we said it must be fit to propose uh, the second point is very important that it describe how it must provide the evidence on which decisions can be made in a clear, transparent, practical way. As we uh, have uh, here today, yesterday, uh, we are dealing with uh, a case study that was cancelled. Uh, both the project was cancelled, and uh, I, I don't know. We can make a question: Why would they were they they were cancelled? The, the answer to this question in, in the case of the uh, Heritage Impact Center should be uh, demonstrated. And uh, the, the, the report, the, your study, should give the, to the decision makers uh, the right tools in order to take this decision. So it is not only evaluate, identifying and evaluating the strength and the severity of the impacts, uh, but in the very last process is uh, to give the right uh, uh, tools in order to uh, find and choose uh, which are the best way to, to follow. Um, we always have to consider, we go forward to this point, uh, the statement of outstanding universal values. Uh, who, so the holders that are bringing these values, so who, who values the place and why? This is very important in order to uh, assess the social impacts towards uh, uh the, the the property um these uh, you can read uh, more deeply inside the guidance and just uh, i just highlighted in red what are the key concept um going uh, deeply inside the process i just want uh, i just uh, uh, try to summarize in this uh, diagram it's maybe too dense like a procedure to follow uh, starting from uh, the step that we stay, the stage that we stay, uh, we, we are here now, that is the evaluation that we're identifying, uh, until the uh, last process, that is the mitigation. So, um, once we have identified all the changes on all uh, attributes, and this is the exercise that we will do later, um, we have to ask to ourselves which are the adverse changes. Um, this is the main, uh, it uh, should be separated between uh, two, two different steps. So identifying the changes, not, it doesn't mean that you have to identify in the same moment the severity of these changes. It, should, it could be a second step. And during this second step, uh, that is identifying the scale of severity and the specific change or impact on a specific attributes, this means that you are highlighting the significance of the effort. As we have uh, seen for the significance of the, value, the of the heritage place, so understanding the relationship between uh, the different attributes and different values, uh, we are going to uh, describe the significance of the effort. And this is very important part because we are going, uh, this, this is the step in which our professional skills and experience comes out. Um, and this is the step in which we should use all our data gathering process and all our data analysis. As we have, to re as you remember, for example, for the case study in Villa Adriana, we use a spatial analysis and uh, visual analysis to understand 
for specific attributes of the property, two main points of view, for example, which are the impact on the property itself. Um, which, uh, how can uh, we try? We, we try to predict um, uh, which will be the. Uh, the uh, augmented encroachment towards the property. Uh, in this way, uh, with, the, with the data analysis, we can give the exact significance of the effect. We can uh, exactly demonstrate if this is a high level or a low level of severity. Um, the, the next step, once we have this uh, old table filled, uh, I, I call it table, but could be different tables with for different aspects, uh, we we can try to think uh, how much is impacted, how long uh, is the is the impacts direct or indirect. We will see in the next slide uh, all the different uh, uh, kind of question that we can need, and um, very last question is uh, once we have all the data collected and uh, organized uh, in a very uh, clear way, are these impacts affecting the OUV? The answer could be obviously yes or no. Um, we are facing in uh, during uh, uh, in this in this case uh, for uh, impacts that are affecting the OUV. So if the answer is yes, uh, the next step is uh, is it possible to avoid or minimize the impacts? And we will go uh, in the next presentation with the mitigation process. Uh, if we can highlight and demonstrate that this is, these impacts are not affecting the, the OUV or uh, are affecting the OUV in a very low uh, severity, very low strength, uh, and the answer so is no, it's not affecting. Uh, we should ask: uh, uh, Are these impacts beneficial for the UV or otherwise? So the uh, opposite question. Uh, trying to highlight, as we remember in the first diagram, the opportunities kind of coming from this development uh, towards the property and towards the holders that are uh, managing the values around the properties. Uh, so two different uh, process comes out for two different answers. If we uh, go toward, uh, if we can answer yes, we have to go to uh, the mitigation process. If we go uh, no, we have to go through the enhancement process to highlighting all the opportunities coming from the development. Um, the impact could be, as we have said, mainly direct or indirect. As you can understand, direct impacts is uh, um, simply is, uh, more simple to highlight and to assess because we uh, always have the, we can very uh, clearly understand that uh, very tall buildings uh, is impacting is as a visual impact towards a specific property. But uh, indirect impacts are more um, difficult to um, highlight and also to demonstrate uh, which are the effects that comes out uh, from these indirect impacts. Um, the main uh, um, concept, the categories uh, of uh, typologies of impact that you can uh, deal with, um, it could be summarized as in this circle. So. Um, should, uh, could be this impact uh, temporary or not? This is a very important question. Uh, the time of the development, the timing of the development, because uh, it happens, for example, in a different uh, heritage place, uh, for example, for the cable cars, um, in some parts of the, in some examples, this kind of development uh, uh, was considered as a temporary development. So because it starts in the in exact period and uh, it ends because it has a, his life of, uh, uh, of, uh, of work, no? Um, and this uh, approach in uh, considering this temporary impact also uh, brings to consider as uh, uh, not affecting exactly the OUV. Um, 
other kind of uh, very sim very uh, very clear impacts could be obvious the visual one and a lot of uh, uh, HIA you can find with very beautiful renderings uh, with views from the property and towards the property highlighting how the new development in this case buildings or housing or etc as in are impacting uh, the visual uh, view the views uh, of the if the views are identified as an attribute for the values, and we always have to start from our first assessment about values and attributes. Uh, we should consider if it's reversible or irreversible, uh, if it has economic uh, impact, but also economic uh, uh, opportunities for the uh, <clears throat> communities around. Um, and uh, OK, you can, uh, if you for the indirect uh, impacts, you can should consider if Merize as a consequence of something that is happening around it, and show uh, as we say uh, at the beginning, we should consider the wider settings and not only the the property itself, because we should uh, uh, we should be able to relate single impacts to the wider to what happened what is happening uh, outside the property. Um, as you can understand, as we started, that is a very complex uh, uh, cloud around the, all, evaluating all the changes around the product is a very complex cloud evaluating all the kind of impacts that are going towards uh, the inside our assessment. Um, we have some tools and in this case, the guidance give us um, some uh, kind of tools. This is an example of the giving the exact scale of severity of the impacts or changes, as we can we can call it. And um, at the very last step, before asking if it is uh, uh, evaluating if it is a negative or positive impact, we should highlight the severity. Uh, we can use this kind of approach. So, giving a, a color scale with the one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, um, values uh, from no change to the major change. And uh, uh, this scale of severity depends of, on two main uh, components. That is uh, if it has a single effects on the property of cumulative effects. Uh, as you can uh, understand, this is very different because a single effect could be uh, followed by a single mitigation process, cumulative effects brings it uh, to uh, different approaches, uh, trying to understand how to mitigate different uh, uh, things that is happening around uh, to in order to uh, mitigate the, uh, the effect. And uh, also in this case, we should consider if the single effects or cumulative are direct and direct, temporary or permanent, reversible or irreversible. Um, the scale of severity, and this is an example from, from the guidance, uh, we can use this kind of approach, uh, is we should consider that in the case of the how UV, uh, we have on the X axis the scale of change and on the Y axis the importance of attribute. The concept of importance of attribute is a very um, risk component. Uh, concept. It, it's very difficult to give uh, importance to a specific attributes uh, instead uh, uh, another one. And uh, if you uh, have to deal with this, we always have to demonstrate why you are giving different impacts. But in the case of an uh, impact assessment in world heritage poverty, we uh, always have to consider the OUV attributes, the coming from the or UV, the outstanding universal values, at, as a very high importance. So we are always dealing with the very last row of this diagram, considering from no change and major change. We can use this diagram for other attributes, not exactly uh, related to the OUV, to distribute and identify exactly if there are slight moderate, moderate slight, moderate change, uh, uh, to be honest, this uh, color scale is very difficult to um, interpret and to uh, manage because, as you can see, there, the difference between slight moderate and moderate slight is very, very 
thing uh, that is also the same with to, between moderate and moderate large. So um, in this case, you should uh, remember and consider always that uh, considering attributes related to outstanding universal values are always very uh, important attributes, so should be considered as at very high scale. So the scale of severity should go from no change to major, the very last row of this uh, diagram. Uh, in the guidance itself exists some misunderstanding. For example, this is an extract from the guidance and uh, we can read that uh, uh, the table two shows, the, for example, that minor high impact, impact is described as being noticeable change and moderate impact is described as significant change. So giving all, uh, enlarging the scale of severity, <coughs> so creating a lot of steps between one uh, evaluation towards the other, so slight, moderate, etc., obviously can create different uh, difficulties in evaluating the impacts, but also reading from outside, from the same, for example, uh, from the decision makers approach, uh, the exact, uh, which is the exact um, strength of these impacts. Uh, so we should always take in consideration not to be ambiguous uh, during our uh, evaluation. Um, I just give you uh, an, underline the, the, the an example, a practical example we have seen for the goal, uh, old town of goal uh, HIA. Uh, so this is the final um, summer, uh, summary yeah, of the, of the, of the rebuild of the, our evaluation starting from the attributes. So highlighting each pieces uh, of the, uh, each components of the values. Uh, we described the nature of the negative impact and um, we can uh, we highlight if there is or not the impact potential impact on OUV on uh, other values and in this case we also add mitigation measures because this is a summary at the very last part of the report. Uh, there are different tools, not only the one proposed from the guidance uh, and the other is coming uh, uh, from the new guidance. And uh, um, you can find some example and we will put this material also in the, the folder, I think, um, that can highlight uh, uh, and can manage in a very, uh, very more simple way, uh, the scale of severity. In this case, for example, the, the first, uh, this one, this uh, diagram, uh, there are not the difference between slight moderate and slight, uh, 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 slight uh, not noticeable. So uh, the fact that you can exactly um, give your uh, evaluation and uh, uh, in, uh, in a very simple way, it's also uh, come, uh, brings also you to demonstrate very simply which could be the mitigation uh, associated to this evaluation of the strength. Um, once we have all, uh, uh, once we have done all this process until the evaluation of the scale of severity of the impacts, we have to come back to attributes. So following the, uh, the first approach, uh, starting to from the statement of standing at the valley, identifying the attributes, identifying the impacts. Uh, these two components, so impacts to world attributes, make the impact assessment uh, uh, the specific part of the impact assessment. This should be related um, always coming back to which are the values that are affected from these impacts. And this is the um, uh, in the, during the step of impact assessment, you have, we should relate to the attributes. But during the suggestion of mitigation uh, measure, we should relate to which are the values that are affected and which are the value that could be enhanced to the world, to this, um, uh, towards this development. So uh, we always have to come back to our statement, to our uh, understanding of the place, to our significance of the place, and really come out from the analytical process 
try to understand uh, exactly which are the values that are affected and, or an answer from the concept and uh, uh, going to the next step that is what will be described in the next presentation. Um, we, we also talk that uh, we can deal also with the positive impacts. In this case, uh, you can produce some kinds of tables like this one for the Gaul historic uh, uh, town, old town of Gaul. And uh, we put together, we try to put together in order to describe uh, both the approach uh, and to highlight uh, if, if uh, what is happening uh, exactly uh, comparing the positive and the negative. It's not exactly the final goal uh, of, of this uh, step of the process, but uh, it, it should be um, uh, it should be uh, one of the steps that you, you, you should follow once you highlighted that uh, something is not impacting uh, the OUV. And so you remember the, the, the answer to be yes or no. Once you answer you no, know, you should highlight also the positive and evaluate and also the strength of this positive impact. So, so uh, you can also deal with this kind of a table. You can find other solution, graphic solution uh, in order to compare uh, positive and negative. Um, we go, uh, we, which is your task in this uh, next exercise. You will have uh, uh, your uh, values and attributes, I hope, um, uh, table filled. So uh, you have the ID, the name of description. Um, you will have another table that is a blank one. So you don't have to be scared about this blank page, <laughs> but uh, uh, I just put an example. Uh, so starting uh, from the identification of which are the project actions having the potential cause or impact. For example, uh, I just put, uh, we are talking yesterday about the archaeology underground uh, before starting with the development. So digging the, for, for the foundation of the building could be a potential impact uh, on the OUV. Uh, once you highlight this, this kind of action, you should be able to understand if it is outside or inside the core zone. Um, you, you should list the, which are the attributes uh, that uh, are impact, could be impacted from this action. For example, in this case, I put churches, the root path for the tunnel. Uh, during the excavation, could come the other part of the existing buildings as uh, it happens always in, during archaeological investigation. So the, the action of digging for the foundation, uh, it's uh, an action that is impacting a specific attributes. In this case, of the, for example, the church uh, or the foundation of the church. And these attributes is uh, related to a specific outstanding universal value. So our evaluation is that uh, this action is impacting the, this value in this way with this thing. Uh, for your exercise, you have to list the actions, the attributes that are affected uh, inside or outside the properties. And uh, you should fill with an X if uh, it happens or not. Uh, the next step will be described by Sarah. That is, uh, as we saw in the diagram, giving the scale of severity and the significance of these uh, uh, impacts that you highlighted. Okay, I think I stop with this presentation, it's finished. And uh, if there are, I think, any questions, just, uh, okay. Yeah, I can wait for, for questions. Dr. Ahmed, if you want to say something, please. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, uh, Scanio, for this important and uh, very informative, actually, uh, presentation. It's, it's really very clear. Uh, however, I have, um, you know, uh, some questions, okay, to clarify the, the process uh, uh, better than. Actually, my first 
question. Uh, we need a little bit uh, more cl uh, clarification about the cu uh, cumulative actually uh, impact. Okay, so please, if you give some uh, examples uh, about about that, this is one thing. The other thing, actually, uh, regarding um, you know the the reversibility. Okay, so you mentioned. Um, you know, the cable car uh, as a temporary, let's say, impact might be on uh, on some sides. Uh, so I I I uh, I don't know here uh, exactly what do you mean because uh, if we take uh, the cable car, yeah, it's reversible. It's a reversible intervention, so it, it could be removed. This is more th theoretical, but if you take its uh, I mean, costs, uh, I don't think it's, uh, uh, we can consider it as a, re a reversible one because, no, you no. know, we have th this problem in Jericho and uh, we are dealing with it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know very well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, I, uh, this is one thing. The other thing, actually, when we speak about reversibility, for me, it's a little bit ambiguous, to be, to be honest, because we, ha we, we can have many small interventions Okay, and we consider yeah this uh, intervention uh, is reversible. Okay, so we we can accept it. But uh, if we have many reversible uh, reversible interventions in the same side, so then together, okay, uh, could have a lot of impact on uh, on the site and its OUV. Uh, sorry about that. The third question, uh, can I ask it or after the, your reply? I, I think uh, it's better if I reply because I have a lot of questions, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, I have, uh, okay, okay, I can ask it. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, after, uh, after that. a brief uh, answer. Sorry, yeah. okay. So uh, regarding the, the, the temporary and the cable car example, I don't want to say that uh, absolutely that uh, cable car could be uh, considered as temporary impact. I know that it's reversible, but it's very huge impact. Um, uh, this comes from... Uh, uh, a very um, recent example uh, in Germany, if I well remember, in which there was a very big discussion about uh, the cable car in, uh, I, I don't remember exactly the name of the property, I will find it, um, a, a very big discussion if it should be considered as a, a temporary or not temporary uh, development because there are a lot of pressure there was a lot of pressure from the community because this cable car will bring a lot of economic uh, um, uh, strength to the place so the community really want this cable car uh, what they uh, so they are not they, they really don't know how to deal with this the final uh, interpretation was to consider this cable car as a temporary impact. So the conclusion was that uh, this temporary impact is not impacting the outstanding universal values of the place. Um, it's not, a, uh, I don't want to say that it's a good example, but is an example, this is something that could happen, okay? And you should always consider it, uh, this kind of approach, how it would be interpreted interpreted uh, the the uh, your evaluation uh, because if you say temporary if you say reversible you should demonstrate if it was reversible in which way and which are the um, effectiveness of the, uh, the rever reversibility uh, so it, i just uh, with that example uh, i just want to highlight that uh, from your evaluation it could be interpreted in different very many ways different many ways um, about regarding the cumulative impacts, uh, this is a very complex matter because uh, um, I, I just try to describe during the process that, that you should, you should uh, focus and fit to propose. But obviously, as we describe the the um, the place itself, the context itself is very complex. So uh, everything inside the heritage place uh, is cumulative because everything is. Uh, the sum of some of, uh, single pieces. In this case, for example, if I want um, just try to give you an example, we are, uh, I give you the example of digging the foundation for the, uh, 
for the uh, for development. This brings to uh, creating, uh, for example, pollution, to creating encroachment during the activities of uh, the creation of the foundation not only so impacts related to archaeology to historical values to uh, very specific cultural values of the place but this is related for uh, it accumulates with the encroachment with pollution with uh, I don't know other action that is coming from that kind of activity during the development so you have to consider not single impacts uh, uh, separated impacts, but the sum of these impacts, uh, and if this uh, is really uh, dangerous or not, which is the strength um, uh, towards the property. In this case, we uh, we should consider uh, from every action, the action doesn't uh, uh, stop in itself, uh, but can create the question should be uh, can create this action other action related to this, uh, and this other action could create other impacts related to the property. Uh, these can help you to understand if there are some impacts that could be um, make uh, one plus one, one plus one. And so create a cumulative impact toward the property. And uh, last question, I don't remember the question. <laughs> I forget the question. Uh, the last uh, question, um, yeah, about the reversibility, you know. Uh, so it's related to uh, to the capital, but, but, yeah. Yeah, but, but here uh, I'm, I'm speaking about small interventions, you know, which could be considered as uh, reversible interventions. <laughs> okay, so we can we, uh, we can allow it. I, I mean, but uh, if we have um, uh, such, I mean, if this action repeated many times, okay, so together it could could be irreversible. Okay, Absolutely. so this is, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, and the, the last question, actually, I'm, I'm going to just uh, give it to you now about, you know, uh, the scale of, uh, of severity. Uh, severity. Yeah, yeah e exactly. Uh, so uh, actually, I'm, I'm thinking about your, uh, that uh, the, the skills you, you give, mostly I can say it's more, uh, uh, we are describing describing the scale, but uh, why we don't go to have an absolute scale? For instance, uh, when we say it's a slight, okay, the slight should be, uh, for instance, affect you know the property or the uh, the OUV uh, with uh, from one one to ten percent. For, for instance, okay, to give us, you know, a, a tool in order to measure, you know, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is my, because, you know, every person, okay, will have his own interpretation uh, for, uh, for the scale itself. But uh, if, we, if we can measure, uh, you know, the, the impact, you know, with some absolute scale, I think it could be better in order just to put, to put uh, some indications, you know, uh, to uh, uh, to us or uh, to uh, to, uh, to schoolers who, who is going, you know, uh, to measure uh, such such impacts. So this is just, uh, you know, uh, my my proposal for that. Thank no, you. No, yeah. Yes, Sarah. Yeah. Sorry, I only want to interrupt on this last question because it's um, it's a very good question because I've been in discussions recently with different people in the advisory bodies about this. Okay. <laughs> so this shows why, why it's such a good question because it is causing everyone to think a great deal. What, you, um, what you're talking about having these, um, you know, a, a, almost like a rule, we, we call it usually a threshold in impact assessment where, you are re where there's a decision that at this point, if I go beyond it, it's a problem. Yes, yeah, so there's very clear definition. Unfortunately, um, this is something that it changes according to the OUV and it changes according to the place. So it's not been something that can be given, you know, it cannot be provided to a place that, um, you know, the World Heritage Center says, your buildings must never be above 30 meters. This is, this is a, the, the sort of example that's often requested. We want rules about how 
we can deal with um, urban development. For example, the case in Vienna recently, they were looking at buildings that were too, they thought were too tall and they wanted clear instructions about what was appropriate. But what's appropriate in Vienna is not appropriate in Bethlehem or London or uh, we looked at a town like Livingston in Zambia. It's always dependent on the outstanding universal value. So the only solutions that uh, the discussion is now coming to the idea that this is why we need to tie in better to the management system. So when a site in, in an ideal world, when a site is nominated, this would be part of the discussion around what is um, what is the outstanding universal value and what, what do we want to do to protect that? And you would def make those definitions at that early stage because then it would be very clear if a development happened, one could already say this, was, this has been defined um, and it's very clear for this one place. Obviously in, in properties that are already listed like our case here in Bethlehem, it's something that we think might be part of management planning where again, it's a discussion about what is acceptable, what's appropriate for this one place based on the analysis of outstanding universal value. So it's a, it's a very valid question that everybody is struggling with, but it might be something that each management team for property uh, needs to define according to the place they're working in. So that's the current discussion happening with the advisory bodies. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you, Sarah. I just want to add this because uh, maybe I, I, I'm not, I was not so clear during this step. Huh? Um, just share the video, the screen. Yeah. Okay, if you remember this diagram, I try to highlight here that in, in this very uh, difficult step as we as Sarah described this so highlighting the significance of the effort this is the step in which we have to use the data analysis when you make uh, a visual impact sir, you should able you should be able to say that uh, I don't know 30 percent of the property has a visual impact from this point of view or uh, I don't know exactly how many square meters are impacted okay uh, this is uh, that is the reason why I, I highlighted this kind of uh, uh, relation. Each one, each uh, <clears throat> uh, assessment, each evaluation on the significant should be attached to uh, analytical, numerical, demonstrated uh, data that you can uh, uh, provide uh, in order to say why and how much uh, this happens. So maybe I, I was not so focused on this, but uh, also during the discussion about which is the role of documentation in impact assessment. The role of documentation is also is every, uh, in, in each step to provide uh, data and uh, analytical <coughs> uh, information to quantify uh, the, the exact impact of the specific attributes. So just to focus on this. Uh, thank you, Ascanio. Uh, actually, we uh, we are now already taking uh, the time of the uh, exercise. Uh, we have probably uh, two hands raised, uh, Zahra and Tamara. If these are quick questions, please, uh, we start with Zahra and Tamara. And if there is, if the answers could be done through the group work, that would be perfect. <laughs> Just okay, yeah. Questions now. Hi, thank you, Ascanio, and everyone. Uh, just very quick question. I would like to ask when you are, we were talking yesterday about the excavations when we we're considering the construction beside the nativity church. My question is if we don't consider excavations and we want to build above the site without doing the excavations in a, because we don't have the money to do the excavations or uh, we don't have the time and the capacity to do that. And do you think it will be an impact on the site, its values or attribute? If we build on a site that we don't excavate, um, and we think we maybe you, like the, the one near the nativity is very important, and we might find something like in this case. Yeah, thank I, you. I, I, I don't, yes, thank you. I don't know if it's uh, possible to build something without excavating. Yeah, the there is. Uh, oh, there okay. are solutions structural wise. You can do like two, three floors above the ground if you do like a concrete slab. 
it unlike uh, forced uh, concrete yeah, slab? Yeah, yeah. This is, could be a mitigation to the problem of excavation, but for example, creating a concrete slab could we create a, a new impact because we are completely covering and uh, uh, cutting off all the potential next future uh, excavation that could be done to enhance the OUV of that place. So if we have to answer to is the excavation uh, could be mitigated? Yes, we can build without excavation, but this what creates uh, other kind of impacts. So uh, each, uh, each one should be considered for what, what it is exactly. Thank you. Tamara, please. Uh, I want to ask uh, if we have a proposed uh, project that uh, causes a negative impact on the OUV or some of the attributes, but it's reversible. So do we allow such projects just because it's reversible? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I'm just laughing because it's a very <clears throat> difficult question. Uh, you should consider if uh, how much is reversible and how much is impacting and if this is cumulated uh, uh, with other impacts so it's not the related to the uh, specific one but once we have to choose to consider if to put i don't know uh, if to go forward or stop the the, the, the development you should consider a different aspect, not a single one that is considered reversible. No, I don't know the, the specific case. Is there always a sum of impacts? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could just add very quickly, because we don't have time, I think we need to be very cautious about our use of the words temporary and reversible, because um, temporary should mean temporary. It, it, for example, in, in environmental impact assessments, it might mean that they, they close access to uh, a town square because it's being used for the construction. But after the construction project has finished for six months, sorry, uh, then the access to that square is reinstated. That's temporary and, gen and really means that. And reversible again, lots of people say something is reversible, but in reality, it isn't. So we just, um, also, if the developer says something's reversible, you check it. But we must be careful that we're precise with our language because that helps for all the impacts. We need to be able to define things very precisely and it helps then uh, to come to conclusions. I, th I think then we probably do need to start group work. Mohamed, are you happy to? Uh, yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, we will be uh, changing a little bit than uh, uh, we did in the last days. Uh, we'll be having two groups, um, uh, one led by Sarah and the other by Ascanio, to fa actually to facilitate the discussions and uh, uh, if you have questions inside the groups. Uh, so we'll just um, merge group one with group three and then group uh, two with group four. And we uh, wish you a pleasant uh, exercise. <laughs> Yes, of course, we'll be having according to, uh, to the program around 60 minutes um, for, this for this exercise. So uh, uh, Nermin will now um, create the rooms quickly and we'll, uh, we'll open, the rooms. open the rooms, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. One, scan you one, 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 غير الاسم ما بعرف بسيطة هي الحين بتحل ونرمين بت بلا ترينيم اسمك طالع طيب مو مفكر مشكلة الاسم بعدها هو اللي مش معقول جبر غزال جبر رجوب أي واحد أحسن جبر رجوب كان الرابع هو بتحطيه مع الأو مع ال ثلاثة اللي هي إيش صارت وان صح؟ جبر رجوب وان ولا شو؟ ما كان اسمه جبر ما شفته بالله انا جبر فور يعني على تو 
محمود اسمه كان في كل ايوه يلا سلام محمود زياد هذا ما كان ولا لا زياد اول واحد Okay. We're all back. Seems so. I think so. Okay. In the in the program, we have another presentation now, quickly, and then we have a coffee break as your reward before we have some more time for for group work. Okay. So we're we're continuing this exercise. Mohammed, are you okay if I do the presentation? I like to have my my boss in the office confirm. <laughs> okay, we don't want to lose too much time, so let me. No, I think he's not hearing. Yeah. They are, but they are not listening. Maybe so okay, you can okay. start, They're Sarah. Not... We save the yeah, time. We're, yeah, we're now. Yeah, Zahra is in charge. <laughs> I, I, I had an urgent phone call. I'm sorry for that. Sorry, no. no. <laughs> I, I can't decide for a small issue. <laughs> yeah, no. Don't worry at all. Okay. Um. So today we. As you have now seen from Ascanio's presentation and the work that we are in the middle of doing, we are at the heart of the impact assessment. So this is um, this is today where we really begin to understand what we're doing. And I think uh, as I move on to the next step, we just need to remember why we're doing it just for one second. The whole idea of impact assessment is that we're supporting good decision making, okay, and that we want to make sure that the, the world, modern society, can move forward. We can't block uh, humans in the situation that we are today, but we need to make sure that as society develops, we're doing it in a healthy way that is respectful of the special places that we work in. Yeah, so we have been discussing just now the impact, understanding a project and understanding what parts of those projects might be a problem. And this is what we'll continue to do in the exercise is to really uh, see how the project might affect uh, the world heritage. However, that's not enough. It's um, it is very often what we do as heritage people. We often say, this is a problem, this is not a problem, but we don't often have the opportunity to then be creative about trying to find the solutions. 
So this next presentation is about this. It's about finding alternatives and mitigation so that we don't just stop by saying the project is a problem. We try to find potential solutions. So um, mitigation is, is always been part of impact assessment. The environmental impact assessment world has always involved mitigation. It's always been um, trying to find solutions and we want to avoid or minimize the negative effects of a proposed action. And in recent years, mitigation has expanded so that we're also looking at positive impact. So again, it's a creative discussion about how we can improve a proposal. Now, I don't want to spend too much time looking at definitions and uh, terrible English words, but it is useful for those of you who are working with um, heritage management to know that we use mitigation in slightly different ways if you're looking at disaster risk management for climate change. So don't be confused if you find the word and it, uh, I'm using it in a slightly different way. In these two situations, it's usually uh, actions that you're doing to try to, in advance, uh, reduce a risk, for example. What we're doing here is a slightly different version where we really want to find the best solution for world heritage. We want to protect world heritage and make sure that nothing uh, happens to it if possible. We and never lose outstanding universal value. That's our end goal. Now related to that obligation to protect world heritage is this concept of the precautionary principle. So essentially, if we don't know what might happen with a project, if there is no real evidence, we need to assume there is a risk. Now, a lot of developers don't like this idea because it puts almost uh, the responsibility on them to demonstrate that their project will not cause problems for outstanding universal value. And we don't need to always be rigid in our discussions, but if there is a doubt, if there is going to be some form of uh, damage to outstanding universal value, we need to stop and consider well in advance of acting. And this is what is the precautionary principle. And it comes actually from the, the Rio meeting on the Earth Summit. So having been very cautious, let's see exactly what we can do. Actually, discussion, if it starts early in the planning, can uh, resolve most of our problems. And very often these are called a discussion of alternatives where we want to identify preferred options for achieving a project objective. We need to just consider, are there better ways of doing things? And if we do this early, before there is a big investment in planning, there is often a lot more flexibility. If you see this diagram, this is a kind of standard diagram of how a project is carried out, the different steps. If we are able to discuss with the developer early on, you'll see the blue line is the ability to influence that project. If we start discussing very early on, we have the chance of stopping problems before they arise. This is really important. And if we continue to have discussion, we will be in a better position to understand the nature of the problems that we're discussing as the accuracy of our assessment goes on. So this is uh, an attempt to get you to understand how important it is to start working with planners and developers early and to continue that conversation over time, because this allows us to genuinely come up with creative solutions and alternatives. Now, the first alternative that can be discussed is, is this proposed action necessary? Is that it's a very easy first check. Uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Escanio illustrated the, the case of Villa Adriana in Italy, and the proposal was for residential buildings. When we checked through the consultation with the local community, 
they showed that there was no need for housing for the local community. So that the housing, the residential building was going to be for people from out of town. So there was no need in that particular place for that project. So it was quite a simple <laughs> conclusion to come to. And related to this is the idea of um, an alternative, the no action alternative. Most impact assessments require you to look at that. Would the situation be better with no project? In some cases, that's not true. In some cases, the project is fixing a problem and we need the project, but we do need to ask, is it necessary? And then we can ask, how should it be done? Are there alternatives to this project? So for example, you might have a project where the aim is to move people from one city to another. In this case, you've got different options. You might have uh, a road, a railway, you might choose uh, to fly people. These are all options and a road project or widening an existing road might be a better option than trying to construct a railway or vice versa. It depends on the situation, but we should ask how should the project be best done? And we can also talk about uh, alternative means of doing something. One of those alternatives is the location. Could it go somewhere better? Um, in particular with World Heritage, there are very clear committee decisions uh, on mining, for example. Mines cannot go in natural world heritage properties. There are better places for those to take place and they're not compatible in a particular location. But we might also um, look at alternatives in terms of uh, just slightly shifting the site or changing the size of a project. Or there could be different options for site access or different designs for the facility. So, for example, a dam project, you can look at alternative heights of the dam because that will affect the size of the reservoir that's needed. So you can make something smaller and have a um, slightly different format. Now, in addition to alternatives, which usually are discussed right at the beginning of a project, they're very big strategic decisions. What we usually refer to as mitigation are discussions that happen when the plans are already started. So we've agreed that the project should take place and now we're trying to ensure that there are not negative uh, impacts of that. So with mitigation, obviously the best mitigation is to avoid negative, uh, negative impacts. It's that easy. If we can avoid them, we should. And the other one that we like in World Heritage is to minimise the impacts, making them so small in some form that we're not concerned about them. So those are the two options that we really enjoy in World Heritage. However, it's worth you knowing that often in environmental impact assessments, if you work with those, uh, the big framework of environmental impact assessment, they often use this, which is called a hierarchy of mitigation. Now, the idea is that you start at the bottom, that's the best option. And if it's not possible, you work through the different levels. Now, as you can see, the first two, avoid and minimize, are exactly what I just mentioned for World Heritage. So they're our favorite. The other options, are not ideal for world heritage, but it's worth briefly understanding what they are because you might need to work with them, or at least you might need to understand when other people propose them. Uh, so we have, uh, the next one is rectify, which um, essentially if there's, if there's damage to uh, an attribute, you could repair it or rehabilitate or restore it. Now, obviously, in cultural heritage, that is really difficult to apply. Uh, we cannot consider that damage to an attribute of world heritage is, is acceptable in any case. It's 
applicable sometimes in natural heritage or, for example, in a cultural landscape where you might have, for example, an, um, a pipeline, like a gas pipeline, go through a landscape. And once it's been put in, it's covered and you might restore the natural environment or you might restore an agricultural landscape. But these cases are obviously prob problematic. Um, there's also the measure of reducing negative impacts over time. This is, for example, through preservation or maintenance operations. OK, whilst the, whilst the proposal, the project is taking place. Again, they need to be considered with great caution for world heritage. And the final measure in the hierarchy is offsetting or compensation. Now, I, we need to be very clear. Um, offsetting the uh, the concept is that if you lose something you can replace it elsewhere now it's sometimes done in uh, in natural contexts where we might lose a piece of woodland and we replant trees somewhere else it needs to be clear that with with outstanding universal value you cannot replace it so this is simply not an option for us so let's return to the two preferred options as I showed you earlier, and let's add a third one, because enhancement is, uh, is now something that we would like to consider. Can we enhance the project so that there are more benefits? If there is going to be a huge investment uh, in a project, are there ways we can make that energy and those resources truly have greater benefits for the heritage and for society. Now, examples might be um, conserving the built heritage, undertaking conservation works. It could be providing um, economic opportunities for the local community, if that's appropriate. It could be that you undertake adaptations to climate change to help prevent future problems arising. There's many ways that we can try to contribute um, not all developers obviously want to add to their project, but it's being recommended that if people can see the advantage of developing or the need to develop in or near to world heritage, that gives them a sort of responsibility to give back to society as well. So it's to be uh, very much encouraged. But we need to be very clear that, again, it's not a balancing act. We cannot say that because somebody's offering us wonderful, positive benefits, that we can overlook negative impact. If there is a problem for world heritage, it's a problem, and it cannot be uh, there cannot be a deal done to um, to try to avoid those issues. We need to always avoid negative. Now, I've mentioned mitigation. Um, in this point of the course, and it seems as if it's coming at the end of a process, but it's worth noting that as well as the uh, alternatives being discussed very early on in the planning process, mitigation is not just something that's at the end. If you decide that there is a potential mitigation measure that helps avoid or minimize those negative uh, impacts, that needs to go into the assessment. So I'll give some uh, examples in a minute, but I'm, I've, I've suggested mitigation. That now becomes part of the proposal and that will need to be assessed so that you understand the new impacts of that project. You need to check that they truly have been avoided. And only at the end of that cycle, as you find more and more solutions and you check each time, will OUV be protected? At the end, when you come to the reporting moment, you need to be very clear that the impacts are hopefully totally avoided because of mitigation, and that it is clear that that mitigation is going to take place. Any impacts that cannot be managed in that way, we call them residual impacts. What, whatever's left over is residual, and it needs to be clear what are those uh, remaining impacts and it's that which the decision will be made 
for example, when the committee reviews a report, is looking to see, are there any residual impacts? Will world heritage be truly protected? So let me just explain a bit more clearly the logic, because I've given you alternatives and I've given you mitigation and I've given you the idea of enhancing positive impacts. But let's uh, just say that we can summarize the logic behind all of this is if there is an impact from a project we have to decide if that impact is acceptable it could be a positive impact or a negative impact but is it acceptable to us if it causes no problems for the world heritage then we can proceed there's no problem often though we find there are let's say manageable impacts we need to make sure that they can be managed in such a way that the negative does not cause problems and that might be through the proponent or the developer committing to uh, carrying out certain mitigation or it might be that the authorities who give the permission give a series of rules that have to be followed but in both cases if that's agreed upon then we can proceed if the impact is uh, unex totally unacceptable, there is a possibility of going back again and looking if we can redesign the project. You know, there um, very often these are uh, planning processes, discussions that continue for many, many years even. And if it is possible to redesign the project, then we can go ahead. But when that unacceptable impact cannot be managed and it cannot be removed, we need to stop what we're doing. That's ultimately what uh, the commitment to world heritage requires us to do. Okay, so that's the logic behind mitigation. So I just want to give you a few case study examples to put the theory a little bit into context. So uh, here we are in New Zealand. The property is a large natural landscape and two impact assessments were actually carried out for two different projects. You can see the blue circle here locating it. One um, was a tunnel project and it was, it was simply for tourists to the area to have quicker travel time. You can see it's a very small line, but um, you can see that it uh, goes right through the property. And it was a tunnel cut through a mountain to connect the roads better. And another one you see on the second map was actually for a monorail. And it's, I believe it's this purplish one here. Um, again, it was, for, it was for transportation reasons. In both these cases, after they received the impact assessment, the government decided not to proceed with the project. So this is one of those where it was, um, it was simply decided that the impacts were too great. In particular, the tunnel project, the, apart from, um, it wasn't so much the creating the tunnel that was the problem for what is a natural landscape. It was that they had half a million tons of material extracted that they would have to dump somewhere in that landscape. So it was actually, the impact was not the whole, it was the, uh, the results of that project. And it was considered that was a massive, impact and the connecting roads would also create problems. In the case of the monorail, it was considered that although as a transport option, it was more environmentally friendly than some other transport options, there was still going to be significant impact on the site's flora and fauna. So the state party decided not to go forward. In this case, instead, we're in Nepal. Um, a project was uh, proposed for the East-West Electric Railway. Um, in this case, the original alignment of this was going to go right through the National Park, which is the World Heritage property. Now, the World Heritage Committee was very concerned because, um, well, it, it cuts the World Heritage property in half. In particular, because this is known to be a very important habitat for wildlife species, it meant that they were going to um, create massive problems for these herds of animals to go to their, their uh, 
with respect to their movement around that landscape. And they were also creating an increased risk of poaching that was a real problem. The state party then decided to look at alternatives. And what they chose is, um, so the orange is the original line, the blue is the new route that they looked at as an alternative. In this case, interestingly, it was a win-win situation by moving it out of the World Heritage property, which looks as if it's most efficient. So originally was considered to be more efficient and economically better. When they moved it to go around the World Heritage property, they found that the railway would therefore become more effective for serving more uh, towns in the region. So actually, it was more economically viable because it would be used by more people and more businesses. So they've avoided damage to World Heritage and they have uh, got a better project as a result. So that was um, considered a great success. I come back to Gaul, which you've already seen, but just to remind you, in this case, there were two elements of the um, project that we, we looked at. The tech, it was a technical uh, changes that were requested and which are currently being investigated. It was both to make the impact smaller, the negative impact smaller. And I remind you, it wasn't just the, the built infrastructure, it would also be the, the secondary impacts. In this case, the tourism is a secondary impact. So we wanted to reduce the impacts to acceptable levels, but also enhance the positive impact. In this case, the protection from tsunami. So this is an example of technical mitigation. And I give you one final example, which is um, a, technical, a technical solution, but for a much smaller project. Many of our examples that I'm giving you are very big infrastructure projects, but not all of our properties have those big projects. They have smaller projects. In this case, there was a, a site in Australia where they wanted to put a little visitor center. It's not a very big proposal. It's not very dramatic, but it was discovered that it would impact on the archaeology, the underground archaeology. So it relates to our discussion earlier. Um, in this case, the, the technical proposal was to relocate. So it wasn't a problem that it was within the World Heritage property, but it was still moving the site um, just enough that it didn't damage the archaeology. So that the impact then, when the new project was looked at, the impact um, had gone to neutral. It's not a problem. And the archaeology in this case was protected. So the level of the technical changes will be different from property to property and uh, project to project. There are no easy, um, we can't give you easy recipes, let's say, but mitigation is an invitation to not, um, the heritage sector has traditionally simply said yes or no. And if we are explaining what the concerns are, and that's what we continue to be doing now in our work, it allows the developer and uh, other government agencies to suggest solutions. We don't always have to find the solution ourselves, but by explaining why the heritage is important, what are the attributes, and what would be this very specific impact on an attribute. It means that the other party can then look at what are the options for changing it and making sure the impact doesn't happen. Now, I hope that um, that logic is of use to you because I think that is probably the most useful thing about impact assessment is it's not simply a report which says yes or no. It's a report which explains why. And it's why we have been insisting so much on truly understanding the values and attributes. And then as we move forward in the next group uh, work, really understanding how the, the individual elements of the project connect with those attributes, because we can then start to offer suggestions for mitigation as well. Now, with regard to our program, actually, it's time for questions and then a coffee break.
I think, if anyone has any. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we don't see anyone raising his hand or her hand. Um, I, I've always noticed that before the coffee break, there were fewer questions. But after, uh, shall I just briefly explain then what we're doing after the coffee break? Because we can also ask questions within the group exercise. That's possibly the best way. We'll, re we'll return back to the groups um, with Escania and myself in accompanying each group. We should now be at the point where we can list the attributes in the impact table and we'll be deciding, you'll hopefully remember them. We've all seen it, I think, in our groups now. We've listed the attributes on one side and we will start to identify the, the elements of the project that might be of concern along the top. And then you can see which ones connect, which items of which, uh, which parts of the project really cause concern for which attributes. The aim of the next session is that once we've done that, in terms of mitigation, we don't need you today to have the solutions. That's not the aim of the exercise. But the aim of the exercise would be to identify which maybe three or four of those impacts you think are of the greatest concern that would be worth discussing then in our in our uh, fiction that this project will be happening uh, we're we're pretending that you would want to identify which of those impacts are most serious and you would want to go back and discuss those to hopefully find a solution for changing the project so we'll have coffee and then we'll return to the groups and then thanks to identifying as many impacts as possible, we'll try to agree then which ones we think are most serious. Uh, Sarah, I see Dr. Ahmad is raising his hand. Probably we take this question because before we go to the break. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, really very important uh, what you explained to us. Uh, actually, I have, you know, a question about not the OUV, the other values. If we have severe, uh, you know, uh, negative impact uh, on the other values, not on the OUB. So, what's the solution? Can can we, for instance, stop the project for uh, you know the other values, or we can uh, proceed? And even uh, my question here, okay, might be the mitigations not work. You know, so either uh, if the project uh, accepted and we are going to implement it, it's going, uh, you know, to damage or we, we might uh, uh, get lost, you know, the, the value, the other value, not the OUV. So this is, uh, mm. this is the question. Now, uh, currently in the, the new guidance is a bit clearer than in the original 2011 guidance there is a, a desire that you were very clear the impacts on OUV and then impacts on other value and both should be stated. It's asked that they're stated separately but that both are included. What we're finding is in some cases the impacts on OUV might not be a, the big issue. Sometimes the impacts are on the local values and in that case obviously the World Heritage Committee cannot make a decision because if it's not World Heritage, it doesn't have any reason to comment. But there are cases when the local values are really impacted, and then it is up to the local uh, administration, once it's got that information in the report, to make a decision. So it's a, I think this is a very important issue you've raised. The World Heritage Committee can't, and it, in any case, it never tells a state party what to do. There is always the, you know, the national decision making is respected. But it's even more critical when we're looking at other values. And um, it's something which would have to be discussed locally. So I think uh, whilst we can tell you what goes into the report, what then happens as a final result is entirely up to the, the local situation. Yeah, very interesting. It's a big challenge. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. We will be going now to the break. We'll come back in uh, 10 minutes. 
If we are on time, we'll be able to finish today uh, at one, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See you.
Welcome back, everyone. Break is over, I think. Uh, so, yes, uh, Sarah and Ascanio, please. I think we, we, we are going to, to switch in the break room, right? Yes, yeah, yes. continue. Yes, please. Right. Yeah. We go ahead with the rooms then. Yeah. So it's going to be for 30 minutes. We're going to open the rooms now. Thank you. Dear Muhammad. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Mahmoud, uh, please, uh, excuse me, uh, can we... Uh, uh, get the, um, the completed uh, uh, the completed file which was just in the, the last uh, exercise in our group I think everything will be uh, uh, uploaded to the shared folder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you will have access to it already you have already you have access to that folder Mahmoud yes yes I get okay Mahmoud okay yeah, it's in the folder two group exercise zero two. And we will complete the, and we'll complete the final uh, delivery of the content uh, on Wednesday. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, thank you very much again uh, for uh, being able to join us and uh, to continue this uh, this um, training. Uh, thanks again to Sarah and Ascanio for their time and for all the participants. Uh, for their different contributions, questions, and of course, participation in the uh, uh, exercises. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you all next week on uh, at 10 uh, next Wednesday. Um, and until then, uh, we wish you a pleasant weekend and uh, uh, stay safe. Mohammed, but if you allow me, uh, if the participants uh, need to do something or prepare uh, uh, like presentation, something for next week, okay, uh, please tell us what they are going to do uh, to be ready, you know, for that. If they are going to present something or uh, I don't know. Shall or I just say in, in two words what is uh, happening next week then? It might help. Yeah, yeah, Sarah? please, please, please. We have, we've, next Wednesday, we only have now one more 
presentation uh, and we finished uh, explaining the content and we will use Wednesday to uh, put together presentations for the final day. When we say presentations, we simply mean that the conclusions of your groups. Uh, so that on the final day, what we have now two groups can present what they think are the big issues and we can discuss them together. So that we move from the theory that you've had so far to actually making this uh, a relevant discussion in Palestine today, um, focusing on Bethlehem. So we it, obviously, the more that you can review the presentations, you have them all in the folder, and the more that you can uh, think about the work we've done today, the values and attributes. Uh, example, for example, I'm, I'm talking to the wrong person. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, you already know everything. <laughs> but some people who are less familiar with Bethlehem might want to look again at the management plan or to look at the presentation on the proposed project then when we work next week we're much more efficient but the the time for the preparing of the presentation we're doing on Wednesday and Thursday and if it's useful the only the one document that you could all look at again is the one that describes the overview of the group work there was a document in the shared file which will show you each of the steps that you've taken so far and how we will put that together on the final day so that should help explain what we'll be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And also, uh, I have all, probably one last thing to say. Uh, if the groups feel that there's a need to work even beyond the time of this um, uh, training, uh, uh, in their spare time, I don't know if they have it, uh, they can continue and they can uh, continue discussing and um, uh, probably uh, getting more interaction with each other concerning these exercises. That would be useful, I think. Thank you again. Uh, and uh, yeah, see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.